just the other day, I was begging my friends for new video ideas because, well, my inspiration is all dried up. Uh, so we started looking through new papers together. Uh, and one of the first things we see is this. Spring GPT-4 outperforms RL algorithms by studying papers and reasoning. I didn't even read the abstract, let alone the paper. I was just mad after reading this, fuming, seething with anger, like a volcano ready to rain down hell from above. But you know, then I was like, I can't let myself get carried away by just a little bit of clickbait in a title. I mean, come on, I'm better than that. And as someone who presents this stuff to other people, I've got to go through it with an open mind and really consider what this paper brings to the table, just like I would with any other paper. So that's what I did. I sat down and I read through the paper, carefully considering it as I would any other. And after reading it, I'm even more mad. So please pull up a chair, pour yourself a glass of lemon tea and spend some time with me as I go on a re <laughs> sorry, I mean a review of this paper uh, with all of you. So you saw the title. But what do the authors really do in this paper? Well, the goal is to get an LLM to play this game called Crafter. Crafter was originally designed to be an RL environment that captured many of the core features of Minecraft, but without being as complex and being a lot simpler to run, especially with a lot less compute. In Crafter, you have a character who spawns in a 64 by 64 tile world, and they can see four tiles in every direction. In this little world, the agent can go around breaking blocks, fighting monsters, crafting items, and doing this all while dealing with water, hunger, and more status effects like that. Once the agent dies and a new episode begins, it is spawned into a newly generated random world, meaning that to learn, the agent has to be able to generalize to different layouts and can't rely on hard-coded patterns. Throughout the course of an episode, there are 22 total unique achievements an agent can earn, all of which you can see right here. And like this one where the agent has to make an iron sword, many of these achievements require several prerequisite achievements, making them much more difficult. Agents are evaluated by both the reward they get within an episode and also by a score. Whenever an agent gets a new achievement for the first time in an episode, and also a plus 0.1 reward whenever it gains or loses health. And the score is a number from 0 to 100 that indicates how frequently the agent is able to attain different achievements. It's a geometric mean that prioritizes getting some success for all achievements over consistently getting easy achievements. In effect, that means that the score puts more of an emphasis on the harder achievements than the reward does. To have an LLM learn to play this game, the authors have a very interesting strategy. They want it to learn to play just by using information it gathers from the original crafter specification paper, which is what you're, which is what you're seeing here and is the paper we were just looking at a second ago. Accordingly, the first step of the author's method is to prompt the LLM to extract useful information from the paper. This happens in three steps that are illustrated right here. The first step entails going paragraph by paragraph and asking the LLM or prompting it, does this paragraph contain information on the game mechanics or game strategies? If the LLM answers no, then the paragraph is discarded. Sorry, that is the best trash can I can draw. But if the answer is yes, then there are up to four follow-up questions that are asked. For example, we have another one right here write all information helpful for the game in a numbered list. And these questions are continued for every paragraph until there is a giant database of a bunch of information about the environment and what the agent should be doing in the environment. All this information is then deduped and concatenated into one long context string that describes the important mechanic-based info for the environment. So that's what the first step does. It basically just collects and gathers a whole bunch of hopefully useful information about the environment. Here we can see an example of what a final context string might look like, containing info like collect resources such as wood, stone, and iron to craft tools and weapons, build shelters to protect yourself from monsters at night, use tools and weapons to defend yourself against monsters, all the way down to wake up to start the episode. So that is the paper dealt with. We're not going to use this anymore. We've gotten all we wanted out of it with this context string. The LLM should now have all the context it needs to actually know how to play the game, which brings us to just that playing the game. One of the obvious issues with trying to play a game with an LM is that, well, the game is displayed through pixels and an LM takes in text, not pixels. To remedy this, the authors use a visual descriptor module. And this provides a text-based description of the current state of the environment for the current and previous frame. Here we can see an example of the visual descriptor in action. So for these two frames, you can see that its description is you see grass one step to your west, tree six steps to your northeast, you face grass at your front. Your status, 
health 9 out of 9, food 9 out of 9, drink 9 out of 9, energy 9 out of 9, you have nothing in your inventory. And it also says the action that the agent took in the last step, which in this case was a no op. So it basically has all you would want in an in, in observation, right? It contains information about the player's surroundings, the status bar, and the inventory. And now that we get into the final step of this method, we're going to use this visual description along with the previous context vector, throw those all together into one long string, pass them into this reasoning module. The reasoning module is what we're seeing drawn out right here. It is a graph of several connected nodes. For each one of these nodes corresponds to one of these prompts we can see up here. For example, we have the question, Q1, or the prompt, list objects in the current observation. For each object, briefly answer what resource it provides and its requirements. And that prompt is what is asked in this Q1 node right here. The idea is that by using these targeted questions, we can prod the LLM into reasoning about specific pieces of information that might be important and eventually use logic to narrow that down into an action that the agent can take in the environment. For example, if we follow this upper chain of logic starting with Q1 and ending with Q6, we can see that the first two nodes, Q1 and Q3, prompt the LLM to reason about what interactions are possible based on the current observations. I already showed you Q1 and Q3 is for each object in the list are the requirements met for the interaction. So they're both asking about what's around and what are the requirements so we can eventually figure out are those requirements met. And Q3 asks for each object in the list, are the requirements met for the interaction? So Q1 is trying to figure out what there is, and then Q3 is trying to figure out what we can do based on that. Then that information is passed on to node Q5, where it's asked, list the top three subtasks the player should follow, indicate their priority out of five. So you see now we're going from what requirements are met to which of these we should actually do. And then Q6, we finally ask, what are the requirements for the top subtask? What should the player do first? So narrowing it down even further into a single item. By the time you get to the node QA, the LLM can use the prior logic and chain of thought to choose an actual action to execute in the environment. The text denoting the action is then mapped to the most similar action in the actual action space, and that is what's actually played out. This entire method is in theory general to whatever language model you want to use. You can prompt any language model in any way you want and try and get it to reason and logic about these things. But for this paper, the results unsurprisingly use, the results unsurprisingly, I think, use GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4. And with all that information, we've covered pretty much the entire method. And you know, one thing I want to talk about before we get into the results here specifically, and maybe a little bit of the issues, is to point out that with the recent release of GPT-4, this is not the only project at all that we've seen like this. Recently with Voyager from NVIDIA, we got an agent that could play Minecraft doing all sorts of neat and diverse tasks that you're seeing here. Or in this recent generative agents paper from Google and Stanford, we can see all these NPCs going about their lives and interacting somewhat naturally. And this is also all powered by an LLM. This idea of creating branching logic trees and evaluating them by having a powerful LLM reason through them is, I think, a really neat idea. And so far, up to this point in the paper we've been looking at, those are basically my thoughts. This whole system that the authors have created and developed is really cool. And now, going through this research paper, the next question I'll be thinking about that I'll have in mind is what can I or what can we learn from how this was built or how it performs so that we have something to take with us from this paper into the future. What can we learn from this essentially? And with that in mind, let's dive into the results. Overall, this paper presents three different types of results. The first of which is a comparison to mainly reinforcement learning based methods. These RL baselines that are used for comparison are trained from scratch to maximize the reward in this environment where they're limited to 1 million interaction steps for training. When we look at this comparison, we can see spring right here, and we can see that while it might still not be quite up to human level, there's a decent gap in the score and a little bit of a gap in the reward too. It is still a good bit above the previous state of the art, in RL at least, Dreamer v3, with almost double the score and a little bit higher reward. And it does quite a bit better than most of these other RL baselines, or all of the baselines, but most of them are RL. The authors mentioned that this improvement over Dreamer v3 mainly comes from Spring's ability to do significantly better on some of the harder achievements like Make Stone Pickaxe, Make Stone Sword, and Collect Iron. As they also mentioned, whereas DeepRL methods typically require millions of training steps to do well, Spring only requires zero training steps because it gets all of its information, its knowledge, from reading the paper. It, except for, wait a second, that's not quite right. GPT-4 was probably actually trained for hundreds of billions of steps, right? Uh, or million, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of steps. Um, 
But this is a small issue, right? What they mean to say here is that they don't have to do any fine tuning, just the pre-training, which is very expensive, but you know, they don't have to do that part. So, you know, uh, that that's something to note, I guess. The fact that an LLM can generalize like this, that part is certainly impressive. I don't want to undercut that. But let's actually think a little bit deeper here. Why even do this comparison at all? Clearly comparing RL methods trained on one task and 1 million time steps of data to an LM that was trained on probably trillions of tokens is not quite an apples, hold on, the apples, and I gotta get the stem, comparison as you might say. I should plug my channel right here, by the way, if you wanna see some of these brilliant drawings um, and some more RL, ML content, uh, do consider subscribing. It really means a lot. I make a whole lot of videos about uh, various AI stuff. But yes, as I was saying, this is not an apples to apples comparison, uh, which is what we want when we try and show that one method is superior to another, right? They need to be playing on a level field. I think what we do get from this comparison is instead a better idea of where this LLM based approach stands relative to other methods. Spring can outperform RL methods, uh, but it's still not quite as good as human. So it gives us that rough idea. And that's why I think it's a little bit weird that a few times uh, the authors really like to stress that their method is a lot better than RL methods. It's strange because they're not doing a comparison that would say that one's better than the other, but rather just showing where Spring sort of stands. And if that was the only problem, then I would have moved on without thinking anything else. But this is just where the problems begin, unfortunately. If the point of this table is really to give us an idea of where Spring stands in terms of state of the art, because they do claim Spring outperforms the previous state of the art in terms of all metrics, then they should have given us the real state of the art numbers for Dreamer v3. Yes, that's right. What the authors are comparing to here with the Dreamer v3 and everything else are not the state of the art RL numbers, but rather the state of the art numbers when you limit the amount of training data to 1 million time steps. Which sure, you could say because Spring technically uses zero training steps, uh, maybe maybe we should just set these all to zero training steps and then the RL methods would all do as good as random. But I think most people would agree that that's not a very useful comparison, right? If we go to the actual Dreamer v3 paper and look at the performance of the best trained crafter model, we can see that the reward both here and here reached nearly 16 in both cases. And going back to our original spring paper, we can see that not spring, not even human experts in this case can achieve a reward of 16. It is superhuman performance. Gmer v3 actually can achieve superhuman performance. The reason this number isn't included in the crafter benchmark that you're seeing right here is because these two graphs use over 1 million steps of training data. Here you can see they use about 10 million to get 16 reward, and here they use about 10 or 20 million. After all, if you're going to do a benchmark to say that your method works better than any other methods, it needs to be on the same playing field, working with the same amount of resources. And I think the claim that Spring uses zero steps of training data, therefore it should be compared with RL methods that use small amounts of data, is a dubious one. I think what the claim really should have been here from the authors is that Spring with GPT-4 can outperform the best RL methods that are trained, the best RL methods that are trained with only 1 million steps of data. And even then, that still wouldn't be the full picture because Spring gets a hand-coded visual description that discretizes the environment. When RL environments work with Crafter, they have to learn everything on the pixel level. So learning a representation is also an important part of the problem that takes time. If they were explicitly given, for example, their food or health as a one hot vector, instead of having to decipher it from images, these RL methods might have done even better. So overall, Spring can do pretty well, but you shouldn't be dropping your RL research to run for the LLM hills, at least not yet. So now let's move on to the next set of results that the authors present, which is where they ablate the different parts of Spring to see what is actually important to making this method work. For example, we can see that Spring without the context string does not work at all. The context string turns out to be very important. If they do all the pre-logic in the logic graph, but without the specific ordering, that still harms their performance quite a bit. So that actually helps quite a bit, having the logic ordering with the different nodes. Though if we skip the question and answering entirely and just directly ask for an answer, that does not work very well at all. A matter of fact, it's near random. So the, so the prodding the LLM with different questions before we ask it for the final action does help out quite a bit. And all the prompting there is very much required. And we also see that Spring with the GPT 3.5 instead of GPT 4 is just not quite good enough. GPT 4 has some level of reasoning that GPT 3.5 does not, that is required to make this work. 
So these results are interesting, but just like before, let's think a little deeper. Let's again ask ourselves the important question, what can we learn from this to take with us into the future? And one thing that really sticks out to me here is how important that logic graph setup is. When we skip the logic and directly ask for that action, the model, as we just looked at a second ago, hardly does better than random. And that worries me because the prompts that make up the logic graph and the visual descriptor, these prompts we looked at earlier in the visual descriptor from here, they're both completely hand engineered for the sole purpose of solving crafter, not environments in general, just crafter. And because of that, it's unclear to me, one, if this type of method will really work for many other environments, and two, do we really want to use a method like this if we have to hand engineer compatibility for every new environment? That's a lot of work, and in theory, that is supposed to be the draw of reinforcement learning, right? All it needs is a reward function, and then you can let it roam without any environment-specific engineering. Maybe it doesn't quite live up to that promise yet, but the groundwork has certainly been laid, and that is the goal. And for that reason, it's a little bit hard for me to see the appeal of this specific type of approach. Unless maybe the goal of this is to just get a one-off solution for a single environment, and to be fair, there probably are cases for that would be ideal. So now let's move on to this final set of results, which just shows us how similar methods from a different paper compare. The paper they compare to, or the method they compare to, is this step-by-step -step prompting method. Now, to be fair, this is a method I really don't know much about, but it is interesting to see how it completely bombs with all of the non-open AI models. We can see with GPT-4, it does okay, and with DaVinci, it also does eh, not great, uh, but with all of the other models, I mean, look at this, they, just, they don't work at all. I mean, Bard gets a negative 0.9. I think to do that, you have to literally just die immediately without doing anything. It's actually impressive how bad it's doing. And it does make me wonder if there's that big of a qualitative difference between these models, or what I think may also be likely is that these methods are tuned for one LLM when people build them, right? You have to prompt engineer to get these to work. And if you only prompt engineer for one model, there's a decent chance that other models require other types of prompts or other formats of prompts. I'm really not sure. I haven't experimented with this or anything, but it's just a hypothesis and it is one potential issue with prompt engineering logic like this. It will always change with the model you use. So to wrap this up, I always like to look at the author's conclusions to see what they wanted us to get from this and to see if we agree. So let's quickly go through the conclusion. They start out by saying we study the quality of in-context reasoning and planning induced by different forms of prompts. Sure, I would say that there is some form of reasoning going on here, though I'm not sure they ever talk about planning in the paper. Maybe they don't mean in the traditional sense where you have like a tree of decisions, uh, but in a more informal sense. Uh, but formally, I don't think they ever mention in the paper. The authors also say that quantitatively spring with GPT-4 outperforms all state-of-the-art RL baselines trained with 1 million steps. So they mention it here. Uh, technically, they mentioned it before, right? They, they have the 1 million steps there. Uh, but they say without any training, again, without any fine tuning, uh, GPT-4 definitely had some level of training, a little bit, just maybe a few billion uh, trillions of tokens. So this is, I guess, partially true here, but there's two things. One, why compare against the 1 million step benchmark? I guess there are there is data for that, so it's maybe that's why to do it. It is definitely an easier comparison to do. But still here, they're not taking into account the fact that there is a massive difference in observations. So ignoring that, um, you know, maybe this is partially true, uh, but we went over this, so we'll keep going. They say that their work demonstrates the reliability of LLMs for understanding and reasoning with human knowledge. I do think that this shows the reliability maybe of GPT-4. The other models, though, you know, they didn't fare so well. And they close it off by saying that we hope that our work points to a new way of integrating human prior knowledge into RL training through intrinsic rewards, a hierarchical RL, or sub-goal planning. Um, I don't think they talked about that anywhere in the paper, uh, so I don't know why it's here, but I do agree, definitely agree, that these would be interesting directions. So there we have it. Spring GPT-4 outperforms RL algorithms by studying papers and reasoning. My final thoughts in 30 seconds. The authors designed a really neat LLM-based system to perform some simple logic. While it is cool, I do worry about how useful and robust this sort of approach is. Instead of focusing on comparisons with RL methods, I think a more interesting future direction may be to rectify that exact weakness and investigate how to make systems like this more general and robust. If you like this and you like hearing about cool ML research, consider subscribing. Uh, it really does mean a lot. Or follow me on Twitter if you want some of my hot takes. Uh, thanks for watching.